morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. Again, I want to thank all the frontline medical health and addiction staff for their tireless efforts throughout the pandemic to ensure Ontarians can access the support that they need and deserve. I would also like to welcome our guests joining Minister Tobolo and myself for today's announcement. Adrian Spafford, CEO of Addictions Mental Health Ontario. Betty Lou Christie, Chair of the Minister's Patient and Family Advisory Council and Dr. Dirk Heyer, Chief Coroner for Ontario. I know that each of you have been touched personally and professionally by those struggling with addictions challenges and you have seen the heartbreaking impacts firsthand. This has been especially true over the past year and a half as we've seen Ontarians trying to cope with the stresses of the pandemic. Last year, opioid related deaths were higher than they have ever been before. And the devastating impacts of addictions can be felt throughout the province, in every community, in every family, regardless of race, gender, or income. The only way that we can build a mental health and addiction system that truly works for all Ontarians is by working hand in hand with people like Adrian, Betty Lou, and Dr. Heyer. Your lived experiences and wisdom are at the heart of today's announcement and are what's driving our approach to addiction services and supports. And I know I will never be able to say this enough, but thank you, thank you for all that you have done and that you continue to do. Today, I am proud to announce that we are investing $32.7 million in new annualized funding for targeted addiction services, including treatment and care for opioid addictions. Today's investment will expand and enhance addiction service services across the continuum of care, from prevention to recovery so that supports are available throughout an individual's journey to wellness. This funding reflects three key goals, preventing substance-related harms by connecting people with harm reduction supports, investing in early stabilization to encourage treatment and lay a strong foundation for transitions between service providers and improving access to evidence-based treatment in both bed-based and community-based settings. We are also making important investments in opioid harm reduction initiatives across the province, which includes elements of the Toronto Academic Health Sciences Network's opioid response proposal. Our government is committed to investing in services that support people struggling with addictions. Today's announcement will make it easier for people to find and access support where and when they need it, helping to save lives. So thank you, and I would now like to invite Minister Tobolo to provide more details about these investments. Minister Tobolo, thank you. Thank you, Minister Elliott, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this morning for this great announcement. It truly is a pleasure for me to be speaking to an issue that is so near and dear to my heart. Prior to taking office, I spent several years as a chair of a bed-based therapeutic community where I eventually became a certified addictions counselor. And during this time, I helped many individuals who were struggling with their mental health and their use of substances. Since taking office in my role as Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, I've heard many stories of Ontarians struggling with their addictions and mental health, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to extend my sincere appreciation to everyone working in the mental health and addiction sector, especially for all of you and the work that you've done throughout the pandemic to ensure clients are always provided with the supports they need. Throughout the pandemic, we've worked hard to support service continuity, fill urgent gaps in care, increase access to supports, and build new service pathways. In fact, thanks to the hard work of the many frontline mental health and addiction workers across the province, over 97% of community mental health and addiction service providers remain open and are serving Ontarians. 
Today's funding is part of our government's commitment to invest $3.8 billion over 10 years to implement the roadmap to wellness, Ontario's comprehensive plan to build a modern, connected, and high quality mental health and addiction system that's centered around the needs of the people and their families. This funding will support initiatives such as prevention and stabilization services, including harm reduction workers, rapid access to addiction medicine or the RAM clinics, and addiction consultation services in hospitals. It's also going to support new adult withdrawal management services and treatment beds and support quality improvements in bed-based addiction treatment programs. And I'm especially proud to announce that these investments will also support new youth treatment beds at the Pine River Institute and innovative virtual addiction services provided by Renaissance. With a rise in addiction and overdose rates in Ontario and across Canada during the COVID-19 pandemic, our government is taking real action we will continue to make historic investments to ensure Ontarians struggling with addictions have access to high quality supports that meet their unique needs and have opportunities for treatment and recovery. I wanna thank uh, all of you uh, for being here and I now would like to hand it over to Adrian Spafford, the CEO of Addictions and Mental Health Ontario to say a few words, thank you. Thanks so much, Minister Tabola, for the introduction, and thank you to both you and Minister Elliott for having AMHO here today. I am very pleased to join you on behalf of more than 200 mental health and addiction providers across Ontario to recognize the importance of today's announcement. It's an honor to be here today in this company, along with the ministers, Dr. Dirk Heyer and Betty Lou Christie. On behalf of Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, I wanna thank you all for your expertise, advice and support on the issue we are here to speak to today. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a challenging time for everyone, but for those struggling with a mental illness, a substance use disorder, and for people who use drugs, this last year has been even harder. And sadly for too many, it's also been deadlier. Last year, there were 2,426 overdose related deaths in Ontario. Even more families, friends, care providers and colleagues left to grieve and struggle with the loss of their loved one. In parallel to the COVID-19 crisis in Ontario, we are experiencing an overdose crisis and a crisis in mental health and substance use. More Ontarians are struggling today than ever before. And at the same time, the ever so slow but important reduction of stigma and better awareness that addiction is not about a personal or moral failing means more Ontarians are reaching out for help. More Ontarians are openly talking about their struggles with their mental health and their substance use. And more families, friends, and caregivers are supporting their loved ones to try and find access to support and services to help support them at wherever they are in their stage of health or illness. Sometimes that support comes in the form of harm reduction services to be able to stay alive despite the increasingly toxic illicit drug supply. Sometimes that support comes in the form of high quality peer support Sometimes that support comes in the form of high quality withdrawal management, outpatient or live-in treatment, and sometimes it requires all of those together. As much as possible, that support should follow the evidence-based standards we've got in place in Ontario, such as the opioid agonist therapy as first-line defense. And we need the funding, the policy and training in place to be able to achieve that goal. Addiction to Mental Health Ontario's 2021 budget submission called for a comprehensive and fully funded response to the opioid and overdose crisis. It is critical that we invest in the full spectrum of addiction and substance use support and services to protect and save lives. And today's announcement is a very positive step in the fight against the opioid and overdose crisis. As the ministers have said, it will expand quality access to live-in treatment, including adults and youth. It will add much more needed harm reduction workers across the province and will support expanding RAM clinics. Today's funding will improve the pathways of care for those who end up in the emergency department after an overdose for the hardest hit regions of the province. And it will support innovative programs for treatment such as the virtual intensive treatment program at Renison in Toronto. These are all critical steps to ensure that when someone does make the courageous decision to reach out for help, that they are met with care, not a wait list. Today is very good news and needs to be celebrated. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that this is a crisis and that in order to bend the curve of deaths from overdose, we will need a consistent, adaptive, and data-driven action and funding on a regular basis. 
we will need to continue to build out investments across the spectrum with a focus on getting low barrier care as close as home to possible. I want to thank Minister Elliott and Minister Tobolo for recognizing the addiction crisis and the overdose crisis in Ontario. I want to thank you both for your collaboration and your commitment to work together with the mental health and Hi, uh, my name is Betty Lou Christie. I'm the chair for uh, the Minister's Patient and Family Advisory Council. So after my own personal journey through trauma, mental health and addiction, I lost Pete, my 25-year-old son with concurrent disorders, to an accidental opioid overdose 20 years ago. Sadly, I have seen the staggering escalation of opioid deaths and other devastating consequences and collateral damage since my son's death. A 20 year trajectory of being trapped in cycles and the continued condemnation of people who are genuinely unwell, but are not having their needs met. Life saving and life sustaining must be the priority. Every person has value. Every person has a right to live. Every people need opportunities to survive long enough to find their way to recovery. Every person deserves healthcare options along the full continuum of care. A large piece of that is well beyond healthcare parameters and where it intersects with social change. This funding and specifically the Toronto Academic Health Sciences Network opioid proposal is where healthcare intersects with the broader determinants of health and what people need to find their wellness, whatever that looks like for each and every person. This funding is inclusive and it fosters person-directed care to ensure every person will be recognized, appreciated, and respected for the unique person they are on their unique journey, and to ensure that care provision is adaptable to the fluctuations in people's wellness and needs. It heightens the chance of better outcomes by providing funding for outreach workers and peer support, to addiction medicine, to bed-based treatment services. Together, we can build community and connection through creating safe, safe spaces to heal and grow for people navigating mental health and or substance use addiction challenges, as well as their supporters and families. We all need to feel valued, respected, and treated in a dignified and empowering way. I want to really applaud the health minister for her leadership, tenacity, and grit. I also want to thank the Health Minister for including me in so many discussions as this funding was shaped and allowing my late son's voice to be heard. I'd also like to thank Mr. Minister Tobolo for all of his work. And I would also like to thank Dr. Dirk Heyer, our Chief Coroner for Ontario. Dr. Heyer and I have a very unique connection as he was my late son's coroner 20 years ago. His passion and compassion has been the fuel I needed to get through those first couple of years after Pete died and helped me to become an effective advocate and chair. So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Heyer, our Chief Coroner for Ontario. Well, thanks Betty Lou, pretty hard uh, words to follow. And uh, thanks for, for sharing those thoughts. Uh, sadly, the connection that we share is one that so many other parents, family members, friends and communities have been sharing, especially over the past year. Um, Adrian talked about 2,426 uh, people dying last year. And numbers are always a horrible thing to hear, but each one of those 2,426 people were people. They were family members, they were friends, they were members of communities. And we cannot forget those individuals and the tragedy and the, and the loss that others have suffered uh, following their unfortunate tragic deaths. Um, so my condolences, my, my sadness, I express to all of those who have lost so many. We've never seen so many preventable substance related harm on deaths over, the, over what we've experienced seen, uh, certainly over the past year. So many years lost by so many young lives cut short by what's been presenting itself as an overwhelming epidemic. That said, we're ensuring we do our best to understand and learn from every single death and bring those voices together 
as we think about what to do for the future. The tragic information that we gain from our death investigations is vital in designing the evidence-informed funding strategy that reduce, that, that's made and developed to reduce further deaths and assist those who have and will suffer from substance-related harm. These are preventable deaths and with the right interventions, supports and programs that everybody have discussed, I believe that things can and will get better. So thank you very much for allowing me to attend and uh, great work by everybody here and, and particularly thanks to the ministers. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll now move on to the media Q&A. Reminder for the media, it's one question, one follow-up. Operator, first question, please. From Richard Southern with 680 News, please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Just for the uh, for the health minister, um, minister, it's been over a month since your government released the roadmap to reopen, yet we still don't know for step three how many uh, people will be allowed for indoor dining. We don't know the capacity limits either for, for outdoor events or the uh, change in capacity limits for personal care services. And, you know, step three could be uh, two weeks away or, or less businesses really need to plan. Do we have this information yet, Minister? And if not, when will it be uh, forthcoming? Thank you. You're right. The businesses do need to have this information in order to be able to plan. And uh, it's something that we are actively working on now. And as we did with moving into step two, uh, that we will release this information well in advance so that businesses will be able to be prepared for this. So uh, we are um, ensuring that um, businesses will have that information as soon as it's been finalized and we are actively working on it now. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, you know, speaking of step three, um, we very fortunately today had zero deaths reported. Uh, the positivity rate is below 1%. I mean, pretty much any metric you'd look at is looking extremely promising. Minister, is your cabinet actively uh, looking at uh, moving up the start date for step three at this point? Well, we have just recently moved into step two. And as you know, the Delta variant is still out there. It is still very active. And that is why we really need to take a very cautious approach to opening up further because uh, we have seen situations. There's a, a, a gym in Oakville, I believe, that stayed open during the pandemic. And now the Delta variant is uh, circulating very widely through the population of people that use that. So I think that's a, a very uh, a cautionary um, uh, example for all of us to uh, to work around with and that uh, we um, we want to make sure that when we open we can stay open we don't we want to avoid a fourth wave we don't want to have to move back a step so we want to make sure that we are completely ready and able to uh, move forward based on the uh, expert advice that we're receiving from our chief medical officer of health and all of the advisors from the various committees next question please from Colin DeMello with CTV News, please go ahead. Hi, Minister. I just wanted to follow up on what Richard had asked there. I mean, we're starting to see all of the pandemic um, indicators kind of move uh, really in the right direction, right? Uh, the Sunnybrook um, Field Hospital is slated to be decommissioned. Uh, testing centers in Hamilton are being uh, closed as well. Uh, in in um, Peel, we're seeing there's only one patient with COVID-19 at Branton Civic Hospital. Uh, it, it seems to me like the province had set out all of these pandemic uh, thresholds, and now that the province has reached them, people are saying, well, why are we not opening up sooner than the timetable that we had before? So uh, w what do you say to people uh, about the continued, the additional two weeks from today um, to, to keep businesses closed. Why is that necessary? Well, primarily because of the, of the variant. The Delta variant is still very, very active. We've seen breakouts in several different locations, Colin, in uh, the Oakville uh, gym that I was just speaking about, but we've also seen it in, in the Waterloo area, also in uh, further in, uh, in uh, the uh, 
great Bruce Gray area as well. So it's still there, it's still active. It's, we still need to be very careful. And then we still have to get our vaccination levels up to a higher level because the, this variant is much more transmissible than the original um, COVID-19 uh, variant that came into Ontario. So uh, we have to be very, very careful with this Delta variant. We don't want to have a fourth wave and we don't want to have to take a step back backwards. We want to still keep taking steps forward, but they have to be done very cautiously and very carefully. Hello. Thank you. Since we are, since we are talking about uh, mental health today, um, you know, a lot of people are looking forward to life after the pandemic, obviously uh, being able to interact with others uh, for, for people who are social beings, uh, having that interaction with others is going to be key. Um, it's been about uh, almost two weeks now since Health Canada released their guidelines for what fully vaccinated people can do. Uh, when is, or can you take us through the thought process for Ontario? What are you guys thinking about uh, when kind of formulating what a fully vaccinated person can do and, and how big of a role does mental health of that individual play into it? Well, the mental health component has always been very important to us. We know that it's been very difficult for many, many people this past 16 months with the uh, social isolation, but also with people who have lost their jobs or find that their businesses are struggling. We know that the uh, mental health uh, and addiction effects of COVID are going to be felt for years after the physical effects of it. And that's why we are building up our resources. We are building up our mental health supports, but also our um, addiction supports as well. That is going to be sort of the next crisis, I believe, that we're going to have to deal with. And it's equally as important as physical health. Mental health is health. And so we uh, want to be able to support the health and well-being of Ontarians at every step along the way. Last question, please. And the Yeah, hi, Minister. Um, I'm wondering what happens after stage three. Is there a, a stage four? Uh, uh, you know, when will what will need to be seen, and 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 when do you predict that we will be able to just go about our business without any restrictions? Well, thanks for the question, Randy. Uh, Dr. Moore, our new Chief Medical Officer of Health, has indicated that there are only three steps. And we are in uh, step two right now. We hope to be able to move into step three in, in due course, watching very carefully for the Delta variant. But when we get, when we are finished the three steps, then things will open back up again. And so that's what I think we're all looking for. And that's why we need to do this very uh, cautiously and carefully. Yeah, do you have any idea how, how like how long what you think will be in step three? And also, um, I see that we're, a lot of the um, the field hospitals that were set up um, in, around the province are being dismantled. Um, are, are you why are you confident that we can uh, that those will won't be used that we don't need those any longer? Well, we, uh, we had the, the, uh, the field hospital set up at uh, Sunnybrook and in Hamilton because we, um, we needed to be prepared. And we did reach very high levels several months ago. Uh, we did use the one at Sunnybrook, but, um, but now because of the high level of vaccinations that we're achieving through the efforts of the people of Ontario, we don't anticipate needing uh, those field hospitals because we uh, have over 78% of our adult population vaccinated with at least the first dose. And we are moving very well with second doses as well. So that is gonna be uh, the greatest protection for us against a, a further huge surge in cases because people are stepping up to be vaccinated and we're very grateful to the people of Ontario for doing that. Thank you so much, everyone. That concludes today's announcements.